Good morning. What we will do today is uh, first review a couple of the uh, topics that we covered last time and then um, get into a new topic. <clears throat> I'm going to uh, use the uh, PowerPoint this time to see if this will help. As you remember, we talked about the wave propagation in two dimension and we learned something about the cutoff frequency. Okay, so when you have a waveguide, not all frequencies at all modes will propagate. Lowest frequencies will always propagate because the, in the form of plane wave, but in higher mode shapes, they may or may not, depending on the frequency. Then uh, we talked about propagation, which is what I just talked about, radial resonance, that would be the plane waves. We talked about flexible walls, as a pipe, as a sound wave propagates in a pipe, what happens if the walls are flexible? Well, they themselves can introduce some sort of a resonance frequency. So if the energy of the sound wave goes into the resonances, then it will not propagate. So this has noise control implications that we briefly touched that's uh, beyond the scope of this uh, course. Now, hmm. We're not going to do it twice, but uh, th this, uh, in this class, we will start with the uh, um, change in cross-section, transformers, silencers, and non-plane terminations. And then I will, if we have time, I think we'll have time, I'll talk about a new concept of solving these problems using uh, transfer matrices. Um, just to uh, repeat what we have done, we talked about, I'm showing these just so that you get used to the uh, idea of a PowerPoint presentation for a class. We have a waveguide, a duct that's rigid on upper and lower sides in the extraction between zero and L, which defines the uh, width of the uh, waveguide. And we are able to, of course, as always, write the uh, wave equation that is propagating in z direction. Um, I see now that these are small, but next time I will make these larger. You can see these, correct? Okay. Some are small, some are large, <laughs> in any case. And this uh, expression in the parentheses shows one wave traveling in the positive extraction and the other waves traveling in the negative extraction, meaning there are reflections back and forth. But there is no reflection because we assume it to be infinite in, uh, in length. Um, we can express this waveform simply as a cosine. Uh, it could have been sine. It doesn't really matter based on this, uh, based on this uh, phase delay. So we have an expression, R being the uh, uh, reflection coefficient. Do we have a controller? OK. And uh, K is the wave number. From the boundary conditions on the walls, <laughs> we said, you have seen these before, we say that the uh, phase delay phi x is equal to 0. And uh, from the other boundary condition, now we have uh, sine kx lx b0. What this gives us is a condition, OK? For this waveform to be able to propagate number one, kx times lx. kx is the wave number in the extraction, and lx is really l, OK, the length in the extraction must satisfy this m being an integer. So other waves cannot exist. Other sounds, sound waves with the uh, uh, wave numbers outside of these cannot exist. These are the permissible wavelengths. <laughs> because they are the permissible wavelengths, we now can write the sound pressure in terms of a sum of all the wavelengths from m0 to infinity. Okay. This is, in some ways, the harmonics of the sounds in the extraction. Now, this is the key point, okay? 
since k itself is a ratio of the radial frequency to speed of sound, and it is also a sum of uh, the, uh, the k squares, sum of the squares in x and z direction, and you can now see kz square has a condition that must be satisfied. Okay, what is kz? It's the wave number right up here that travels in this direction. So this number or the square root of this must be real. If it is not real, then when you substitute it in here, it will be a decaying, exponentially decaying number. Okay, so uh, then for frequencies, uh, omega larger than m pi over Lx times c, kz is uh, real and it will propagate. And of course, for low frequencies, for a particular mode, it will be imaginary. We talked about propagating waves in distortion field. <laughs> what that means is uh, what I just described. <laughs> Kz must be real. For low frequencies, only the uh, plane waves propagate. What is a distortion field? A distortion field, in this sense, is uh, when the geometry is an odd shape. Okay. For instance, if you have a, we always uh, we always talk about nice duct or waveguide, etc. Well, what happens if you have an obstruction? Now suddenly this changes. Or you go down here, you have a shape here. Okay? Plane wave boundary conditions cannot be met here. So this cannot handle a pure plane wave. Waves here now have other reflections. Okay, and what does that mean? That means you have to have different spatial space Z and X dependence on it. That's where these higher modes come in. Okay, they have different shapes. Using a suitable combination of that, you are able to meet the geometry of the uh, sound field. That's what's called a distortion field. It's no longer a plane wave. Okay. Okay. Now, you need to start taking notes. <laughs> Today we talk about the uh, pipes or ducts with a varying uh, cross-section. This particular one is uh, about infinitely long horns. Uh, what, we're, what we're referring to here is a shape that comes out as a tube and then flares open, okay? And this flaring open is uh, such that <laughs> the purpose of it is that sound is not reflected back. Okay, remember, when you have when you have a duct or a pipe, okay, <laughs> is the plane waves propagate when they come to the end of it, okay, they will reflect back. Now, this is, this is important. Let me just have your attention just for a moment, okay? Now, we talked about rigid walls and sound completely will uh, reflect. And we talked about resilient, pressure resilient um, boundaries we said sound will reflect. It is true if it is complete vacuum. But in air, it's not really complete vacuum. So what happens is because of this impedance change, see, impedance change is because this is a large area, this is a small area. Same idea here. Okay, if you have, and we, we will see this, if you have sound coming through, at this point, some will reflect back, some will go through. Why is that? 
impedance, what causes the impedance to change? What is the basic mechanism of that? What is different? What's impedance? Go ahead. That's, yes. Uh -huh. uh, in general, it's pressure time over uh, particles. Velocity. Okay, pressure t uh, divided by particle velocity is the impedance. Now, for a plane wave, that's equal to rho c. That becomes the characteristic impedance. But here, something is different. What is different? Say again. Pressure? Well, why is the pressure different? What do you see here? You see something. You see a change here. Cross-sectional area is changing, okay? And what does that do to the wave equation? What does it change? Continuity, okay? What does continuity mean? The amount of mass going in and coming out. Okay, it must be equal. And if that is the case, then particle velocity will change. Okay, so you have to have a continuity. That's where S comes in. Now, the reason I mentioned this, and we're going to get back and study that, but uh, the reason I mentioned this was just to illustrate another point here. And the point is, when you have a when you have a duct is waves are traveling down and you come to the end of an opening, okay, what will happen? Some will have to come back because now suddenly you have a big area change and some will leak out, okay? There will be sound radiated. That's the uh, basis of organ pipes, musical instruments, etc. Now, when you have a loudspeaker, Okay, you want to make big announcements, okay? We have a loudspeaker. You don't want the sound to come back. What is a loudspeaker? This is the membrane that oscillates back and forth. And if you have the sound reflecting, it's going to come back and load the membrane. That's not what we're interested in. We want the sound to go out. So what you want to do is flare this out as long as you can. What does that do? Effectively, it matches impedance. Okay? Here, it's a plane wave. As it goes out, it actually curves some. But then it just radiates out. So that's the reason why horns are very, very... Uh, fundamental to acoustics to help propagate sound to long distances. So in the derivations here, we assume a couple of things. Sound wave that comes in, the plane uh, wave, is perpendicular to the axis, number one, and the uh, walls are rigid. Okay, those are two important assumptions in the derivation of these. In uh, our earlier lectures, probably one of the first ones, we talked about potential, velocity potential, okay? And, uh, and we defined velocity potential as, uh, they're the same, uh, as gravity, gravitational field, for example, is a velocity, pot uh, is a potential. So it's, uh, it's derivation in this case with respect to time multiplied by the density is pressure and it's, uh, it's uh, gradient in space negative of the gradient in space is the particle velocity. The reason we use it is uh, it's independent of coordinates and it takes away the uh, directionality. It's a potential field. And uh, po velocity potential has exactly the same form, oh, you need it, yes. <laughs> exactly the same form of wave equation. So you can write the velocity potential as uh, identical to the uh, wave equation.
if you replace phi, that would be the pressure wave equation, or you can have a velocity potential wave equation. Okay? There's a tendency to go too fast when you use these, so let me know. Okay. Now, the continuity equation, we're driving the uh, continue, rewriting, I should say, expressing the continuity equation for an elemental mass in the, uh, in the horn, okay? Let's just say a, a dx, uh, an element of length dx in the x direction, and the area, the cross-sectional area is S of x, okay? Cross-sectional area S changes with the axis. Density rho and particle velocity V, and again, del rho over del T SX. So uh, the change in mass between the two sides of this elemental mass is uh, uh, balanced by the, um, by the forces. Density is a first order variable and we keep it pretty much constant and use the uh, linearized momentum equation that we have used before. So we are able to then rewrite the uh, continuity equation simply as 1 over s times del sv. What we have done here is what we have done here is take rho out and uh, S and V we kept together. You can see on the left-hand side, this is a partial derivative of the gradient of S times V. That's the area times the velocity. Okay. SX is um, independent of time, so it comes over here. And we now have a modified wave equation. Modified, not quite there. This is the uh, equation that we use for describing the velocity potential in, uh, in a horn. You can see on the left-hand side the spatial dependence and on the right-hand side the time dependence. Now. If S, what is S? Cross-sectional area. If the cross-sectional area did not change along the length, what would happen here? This term would disappear, and you end up with the uh, normal wave equation. Okay. So this is the component. The first part of the left-hand side is what is brought in by the variable cross-section of the duct or the pipe. Now, this part we can rewrite in terms of a natural log. Now, the second term is what we were just talking about. Okay, and that's called the Horn equation. Okay, that's known as a Horn equation. And you can solve a number of different types of uh, cross sectional changes using this equation. Some types of uh, variations, area changes, 
are amenable to exact solutions. And one of these is the exponential horn. Do you have any questions so far? All clear, more or less, okay. Are we going too fast? See, I'm not writing. I did my writing last week. <laughs> so I uh, <laughs> don't want to go too fast. That's everything okay? All right. Yeah. <laughs> Let's assume that the uh, horn now has an exponential variation. Okay. This, this profile here, okay, the cross section here can be described by e to the 2 k sub 0 x. Okay, there's an exponential increase up to a certain point. But we're now considering, assuming it to be infinite. Okay, so there's, we can say then there are no reflections from the other side, from the opening. If you substitute the value of s up in the Horn equation, okay, what we have again is a very uh, simple modified wave equation. And uh, for harmonic waves, where the dependence is uh, exponential minus i omega t, okay, we can rewrite that by eliminating the time dependence <laughs> as a second order differential equation. Are you going to have these slides? I think you should make notes. <laughs> You'd like to have the slides? Well, <laughs> in the future, maybe what I'll do is uh, uh, bring the slides and because I'm adding things to it during the uh, lecture, I think it's good to take some notes. I can also get the slides later too. But I, th I think you should t take notes because I modify as we go along. Okay, second order differential equation with general solutions where S12 is written is a combination of k0 and k squared. Now k itself is, uh, let me see, k itself is the uh, wave number, which is this. k is the wave number, omega over c. And uh, k0 is, just to remind you again, half of the uh, flare constant. Flare means exponentially flaring out, okay, broadening. Okay. This could have been written in the opposite and drop I, but I did it on purpose and you'll see the point in a minute. So the uh, solution finally for the pressure will be, as you can see, in terms of two components. There is a yeah, why don't you write it down and let's talk about this. Now, I would make notes on these. There. <laughs> what do you see here? Remember, we always say when you look at equations, it should tell you something, okay? What does it tell you? What does the first term tell you? Yes? Go ahead. It's a propagating wave with an amplitude. With a what? With an amplitude A, it's first. Well, no, that's this. What about this guy? What does, it, what does it tell you? What does it show you? What is the difference between a term like this and a term like that? Go ahead. It attenuates, yes. This is an exponential decay, right? And this one does what? It's, an harmonic, wave. it's a harmonic wave. 
okay? It oscillates, it continues. So when you multiply them, what happens? Exactly. A harmonic wave with a decaying amplitude, okay? Very good. And so what we're seeing here is that there's a decaying component that depends on the flare constant, okay? If the flare constant is small, then the decay is also slow. And what does that mean? If it is suddenly opened, it's very big, then it's going to decay very quickly. Okay, so it has to be a gradual uh, flare. And then, now, what are these two again? Let's just uh, examine them. Propagating waves, we said. Where does this propagate? Which direction? X. Speak up. Yeah, out. X and out, right? And what does, where does this go? Infinite. Yes? There's no, infinite, there's no reflection. There should be no reflection. So what do we do with it? What do we do with it? B must be zero because it's not a physically realizable solution. Okay, so there's no B, basically. Anyway, <laughs> you can see now uh, the different aspect of this is what happens. The K1 here, we have the uh, frequency relationship. If K0 is larger than K, once again, you have a decaying, double decaying wave in, in some ways, okay? If K0 is larger than K. We do not want K0 to be too large to begin with because it has a decaying effect, okay? And if it is larger than K, once again, this becomes also decaying and there's no propagation. It's a cutoff frequency. As we said, for an for a infinitely long horn, as uh, we assumed it to be, uh, uh, B is equal to zero. So there's no reflected wave. And uh, for a wave, wave numbers less than K0, uh, um, sound field just uh, uh, propagates out. Now, let's take a, let's take a look at the impedance. Okay, the impedance of the plane wave can be expressed as just a, a, a simple set of mathematics. You can see it becomes a ratio of um, the uh, particle uh, uh, pressure to particle velocity. Once we make the appropriate substitutions, let me put the whole thing on here. You can see the impedance is a frequency dependent uh, quantity. Um, yeah. I sure. That's K is bigger than K0, right? For it, some propagate. Um, let's see. K must be larger than K0 for sound to actually, let's see now, uh, K prime, yes, it should be. Mm -hmm. And what do we have here? We have the axis of the Okay, I think that you're absolutely right. I, I think it should be K larger than K0. But let me just see for a moment here. Hmm. Has to be, but my notes are not right. Yeah. When you look at the equations, it should be k larger than k0. 
I'll, I'll check on this. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yes, that's right. Yeah, it should be. Okay. Okay, so the impedance, once again, just the opposite of that. Um, yes. If F0 is larger than F, of course, this again becomes non-propagating, okay? So it has to be, this has to be less than one. It's smaller than that. Otherwise, you have a complete cutoff. Okay. Let me put these, have you gotten these down? The, uh, yes, consistent is just the opposite of that. When F0 becomes uh, larger than F, then the uh, uh, square root expression here also becomes imaginary and there's no propagation. So sound is distorted. I'm going to show you in a minute the uh, numerical results of <coughs> radiation impedance for three different types. Do you have them? Okay. Three different types of uh, horns. We could talk about this for probably a week. Uh, this is a very interesting topic, interesting uh, uh, subject matter. But if you take a, if you take a look at the possible uh, shapes of horns, the exponential, the dotted one, is what we just studied a moment ago. Then there's a conical one, straight line, okay, uh, all around. Just, and then there's a parabolic shape. So you can see here we're using 100 centimeter square at uh, 100 centimeter distance from the, uh, from the source. So one meter out the length and one meter square is the, uh, is the opening. So one centimeter square is where the horn is, okay? The, the opening of the horn. Now, if you uh, take a look at the uh, radiation impedance, how much radiation is uh, put out, you can see the steepest cutoff is the exponential, okay? That means from 100 hertz up, it radiates more or less linearly, okay, not quite. But below that, it's cut off. There's no radiation for this particular shape. Remember, the cutoff is dependent on the flare constant, okay? And uh, there's a cutoff. Now, you can also see, for example, for the parabolic one, how degenerate, in some ways, the cell radiation is, okay? Its radiation ability is really very limited. It's not very clean. At some frequencies, it radiates better than at other frequencies and so on. And whereas the flat conical one, also not bad, but uh, it's uh, not as good as the uh, exponential horn. <coughs> Now, as you're writing these, somebody asks you uh, a question about how do I select a high quality loudspeaker like this? What would you do? What are, what are some of the obvious things that you would like to see? How would you know the uh, quality of a loudspeaker? 
horn loudspeaker, not the other types. What is obvious, what is common to all three, that's, that's an issue. What do they do and what do they not do? Take a look at this. This is up to 10 kilohertz here, 1,000 hertz, 100 hertz, logarithmically uh, spaced frequency spectrum. Would it have been better if this cutoff were at 1,000 hertz? Five hundred, five thousand hertz, would it have been? Would it be a better loudspeaker? <coughs> yes. No. Yes. Yes. Okay. Why? Um. You just want to say yes. <laughs> why? <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Best one is the third one. Best one is the third one, but uh, the, my question now is, would it be better to adjust it so that cutoff is here? No. I don't think so. No. Why not? Because the speech is between thirty kilohertz and okay. Uh, three. No, no, speech, you know, speech actually is between one thousand and four thousand hertz. Speech is up here. Speech is up here. But uh, you want to be able to broadcast all the frequencies as much as possible. What that means is you want this to be as low as possible. Okay? What does that mean, though, to make it as low as possible? <laughs> what does it take to do that? You have to look at your equations and see where the cutoff frequencies are. Cutoff frequencies show <coughs> and the geometry. <coughs> okay, that means you have to have really huge loudspeakers. So there's there's a trade-off between the quality and the configuration and the size that uh, you you can use. Okay. So to be able to bring this down to a lower cutoff frequency, the length, the opening, etc., have to be much larger. This is the real part of the Yes, radiated part, yes. So the, for high quality, the cutoff frequency should be uh, as low as possible. There's a time delay caused by the low frequency cutoff of the horn, and that's given by this expression. Okay, this low frequency causes a little time delay in the uh, in the system. Okay, this is what I want to talk to you about the uh, uh, horns or pipes with varying cross-section and then how they're applied to, uh, to loudspeakers, horns themselves. Okay. Questions on this? Just uh, very briefly, what we did was take the uh, exponential or, well, a varying section. We rewrote the uh, continuity equation and used the linearized momentum. Once again, derived or redrived the wave equation, but using the uh, uh, velocity potential, and then we solved it. And we solved it then for a particular change in the horn cross section. Yeah, see, that has a whole chapter on this that you're reading. <laughs> Right, that is a whole chapter of different types. So you can talk about these for almost a week. Yeah, it's a good book. So we redrived this, solved it, and did do some analysis of the uh, results. Now, what we'll do now is apply that to different types of uh, 
boundary conditions at the end of a tube. Okay, so we have a tube, if it terminates in a cone, a reverse cone, an oblique angle, ending at an angle, a tubular end, or an exponential horn that's uh, shut off. Okay, so these are different types of uh, endings, some of which we will look at. And uh, the question is, how do you go about solving? I'm going to ask you this question to get you thinking about this. In everything that we will drive, we'll just use this distance as d from the end of a normal or regular um, cross-section the moment it goes into the termination. So the termination length is d. Let me ask this question now. How would you go about solving this? <laughs> what would you do here? What is the first thing you would do? Oh. Mm -hmm. Okay, you, we can write what? Go ahead. Okay, one part here, let's say one part there, uh-huh. Wave equation is different. Wave equation is different uh -huh. for this. What is the wave equation here? The horn equation? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, use the horn equation here and the regular wave equation here. And then what would you do? This is an overall plan of attack now, okay? And then what would you do? Okay, these guys are writing and not listening. They're, they're drawing pictures. Okay. Okay, do you see what we're trying to do now? We want to understand what is the acoustic field of a tube that has a different termination than a flat termination? How would we write that equation? Okay, now we said let's consider two different areas. Okay, one side we know what the acoustic field should be like and then we have another side well, we don't really know. And uh, one suggestion was, well, we can use that horn equation and because the area changes as a function of distance. Does that make sense? Can you apply that here also? <laughs> Same process, exactly, yes. And this is a tube, this is a tube. And here you can, of course, apply the same because area is changing with distance, in this case, exponentially, linearly, and so on. Now, what do you do then? What is the next thing? Did you hear what he said? What is the next thing? You're able. Well, what are the boundary conditions? We can consider like two medium pressure and Right, it's a continuity, exactly. And so you have written, you have written the uh, field expression, pressure, velocity, field for this and for that. And what you want to do is they have to be pretty much the same where they meet. So now that you know what to do, we can go very quickly with the, <laughs> with the derivation. Okay, so... This is the uh, uh, tubular part where pressure one is in terms of uh, x variable, cosine kx, between zero and we say this is L minus epsilon just before it gets to the, uh, to the interface where they meet, only because there 
acoustic field is uh, not quite uniform. To be technically correct, we say L minus uh, epsilon. So we use the uh, Horn equation <laughs> for the second part, okay? Uh, and this could be any different type of termination. <laughs> and you see here, this depends on x because coordinate is from zero on the left all the way to L, whereas the uh, Horn equation is utilized for the y coordinate coming from the tip from the other end of the uh, termination. This is identical to what we had a few minutes ago, but written in terms of pressure again. Okay, Horn equation is rewritten, and we make a number of different assumptions. Once again, we say that the uh, pressure and particle velocity are constant in planes. So we're talking about plane waves. We have to make that assumption to drive this. And uh, so we do have plane waves all the way in the tube and also inside the termination. Uh, and they are perpendicular to the axis. When do we satisfy that only at very low frequencies. Why? At high frequencies, we have different shapes, reflections, particularly at the tube end. The uh, second assumption is uh, we're saying that the, uh, the sound field inside the termination is uh, <coughs> the same as when the termination is extended to infinity, meaning it doesn't have reflections there. So. Uh, so we make two major assumptions just so that you're able to uh, use the simple plane wave equations to be able to solve the, uh, uh, solve the acoustic field expression for this termination. We have that. Epsilon here is uh, epsilon 1 is to the left, epsilon 2 is to the right. And so this region, the, uh, the width of that region is much smaller than a wavelength. So it's negligible. What happens there, the perturbations there are negligible. Now, yes, this is what I'm saying. So the volume between... Uh, Epsilon 2 on one side and epsilon 1 on the other side is so small that we ex assume the pressure to be, here it is, that. Much less than lambda. Okay, so as a result, Pressure is uniform in that area. That's the uh, major assumption here. <coughs> okay. This is the uh, what you refer to as the boundary condition now. Okay. On either side of where they meet, the pressure must be the same. That's one boundary condition. The second boundary condition must be the continuity, okay? So uh, again, we say compressibility of the uh, medium has no effect on the velocity distribution. Once again, plane wave distribution, but this time we are interested in the uh, cross-sectional areas, okay? Of course, where they meet both areas will be exactly the same. Okay, so um, these are the two major boundary conditions that we use where the termination and the two come together. Okay? Where the termination and the two, this is the exaggerated part, but uh, come together. And then
Now let's see uh, if we can apply to uh, There's not much else here if you have written it, but uh, now let's see if we can apply it to uh, a couple of different types of uh, terminations, just as exercises. Okay. Let's, uh, let me just move. <laughs> let's now apply it to a conically terminated Tube. Mm -hmm. Okay, this original shape that we had seen. Now, we expressed the area, remember we used before a, uh, an exponential flare. Mm -hmm. Now, R is the radius from the center, <coughs> excuse me, D is the uh, length, and uh, Y is the distance from zero. Mm -hmm. So the uh, area changes with y squared as it goes uh, towards the tube. Horn equation, as before, well, what we do now is substitute. Once you substitute the Horn equation, it takes this form. And the solution now is uh, uh, a wave that has uh, the propagating and reflecting components. But as you can see, it decreases with distance from its apex as 1 over y. So we have to be a little bit uh, careful about the boundary condition that we choose here. The apex, the point at the tip of it, is a, is a singularity. Okay? We don't know the exact values of sound pressure and particle velocity at the very tip of this cone. But we also know that there's no source there. Okay? So uh, what that suggests to us then is an equivalent value to a boundary condition. That says <coughs> y square or area square times particle velocity as it goes to the apex is equal to zero. Okay. Why don't you write this down and let me explain the physics of what that means. Okay. Take a look at this uh, expression here, please, just for a moment. <laughs> Once you substitute an area uh, expression, as I have shown up there, you have a pressure expression that gives you a value that Inver that is inversely proportional to y. Ordinarily, what that means is as you go out, pressure decreases. As the area opens up, pressure decreases. Okay? But it also says that y is equal to 0, it's infinity, <laughs> okay? a singularity. But we know that there's no source even there, so it cannot be <laughs> infinity. Okay? <laughs> so. What we do then is, because there's no source at the apex, you have to realize that an area times velocity, the flow out, has to be zero. And that is the same as saying, that's the area, same as saying y squared times particle velocity must be equal to zero as y goes to the apex. Okay? And so you finally end up with a boundary condition that you can apply to this to evaluate the values of the constants. Okay. That makes sense? Okay. And uh, that gives us 
the value for d plus e equals to zero. And if they change signs, you can see this now becomes a value sine ky over y. Now, now we come to the continuity equations that we spoke about. Remember, the tube itself had a cosine field, A cosine kx, okay, on the left-hand side. And the right-hand side was sine ky over y. So by uh, setting the uh, equations given above, <laughs> evaluating them at L for pressure and for particle velocity, we have two equations. And their division gives us the <laughs> eigenvalue equation for the system. This is, a, this is what's called the eigenvalue equation, but it gives us the resonances in a tube like this. And the resonances depend on KD or D and, uh, and L. That's simply. Now, a simpler equation is the tubular termination. This, you know what to do, right? It's, you know, it's a lot simpler. One writes the uh, sound field in the tube as cosine, and in the termination, also, it's a cosine field. Okay. And continuity is satisfied by evaluating the pressures at the interface and particle velocities at the interface and dividing them, you once again have an equation for, uh, for the uh, uh, eigenvalues. Now, I distributed a homework for next week, and I'm going to add to it the next slide as the third equation, I mean, third uh, problem, as soon as you finish writing this. And, um, for an oblique wall, I'll get back to it in a second. Would you write this down? For an oblique wall, <laughs> a tapered wall, the, uh, resonant, uh, the uh, eigenstate equation, eigenfrequency equation is tangent KL plus the ratio of 
J1 to J0 KD. J1 and J0 are Bessel functions of the first and zeroth order, respectively. Okay, J1, J0, first and zeroth order, Bessel functions. See if you can derive this. If you're able to drive this, you understood this lecture. Okay? This is, I'll leave this and we'll take a break for a few minutes. And if you have any questions, uh, I'm happy to answer. Then we'll move on to uh, abrupt change, the details of this.